Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the, the chat with the grad dean. I'm so glad that you could join us today. You know, here we are at the beginning of spring 2022, not quite starting the way that we had planned. Of course, I think what we have learned most in the last couple of years is that pandemics are not predictable. Um, so we got a little bit of a late start, but I'm pretty confident that come, um, you know, the end of February the 4th, that come the 7th, man, we're going to be back in the saddle again. So I am really looking forward to having students here on campus. I'm here in my office in the Dean's Suite in the Jindal School. And when I came to the office this morning, granted, it was very early. There was not a single car in the parking lot. Now, it was 715, but you know, it'll be great to see students uh, meandering about and saying hello and all of that kind of stuff. So I got I hope that all of you got to your first class yesterday and you've attended your second class maybe today and that things are going really well. For those of you who've you know kind of attended these sessions before or really kind of know me, you're going to know that I am not going to go into a chat with a grad dean without offering some advice to all of our students. So here is the January 2022 advice for graduate students at the Jindal School that I just want people uh, to really keep in mind. You know, there are four critical words that every graduate student should be focused on. One is to always be positive, always be principled, always be proactive and always be productive. If you are those four P's, then then you are going to tackle graduate school with unbelievable um, courage and proactiveness and you can't help but succeed when you are positive, principled, proactive and productive. So don't wait to do any of those four P's until midpoint of the semester when you find yourself behind in a class. Do it now, do it today. And I told students at orientation and I tell students this all the time, this first few days of class, read your syllabus. Look at every syllabi from front to back. Look at the grading um, rubrics. Look how they're going to calculate the grade. Understand what percentage comes from exams, what percentage of it comes from group work or projects. Really know uh, the topics that you're going to be covering. And if you decide that that class maybe is not a fit for you, then make that decision early. Do not make that decision late because if you add a class in place of it, then of course you're already behind in that new class that you add. So again, that goes back to one of those P's being proactive. Um, the other thing that I just want to offer to graduate students uh, here at the Jindal School this year is, you know, I think, you know, we've been through a lot as a world, um, as students in the Jindal School. You know, don't forget that graduate school is not just about setting your trajectory for where you want to go because you think that you want, you know where you want to go. Don't forget to discover yourself. Don't forget to allow yourself to evolve as you're going through this process. That may mean changing direction or changing a track or changing a concentration. So, so don't limit yourself to discovering just because you've committed to this track and this degree program. The other thing, and I think this is really difficult for students today, is to be really to be more open to change. I think at a time where um, there's been a lot of uncertainty, it's difficult to do that. But the more you can do that, the more you will likely land an internship where you least expected it. So sometimes um, just being open to, you know, spending 30 more minutes looking in a place that you weren't looking might uncover that uh, internship that you are going to be so grateful that you had. Um, the other big thing that I just wanted to cover today, and I don't know if it's just technology that has resulted in in putting so much pressure on on graduate students to be perfect. You know, social media, you want to put your headshot, your best headshot out there or your best video out there. And I think that that kind of social pressure, wherever it comes from, whether it comes from, you know, technology or social media, I think it's it's made students less willing to just not be accountable. So so I'm going to tell all of you own your mistakes. You know, own them from the very beginning. Be accountable for where you do well and be accountable for where you haven't. I think that humbleness in this world is going to be even more important in the future than it's been in the past. Um, 
And then also don't forget to to make a friend every day. You know, it's amazing sometimes how a gentle comment to the person sitting beside you in class when we get back to class makes a huge difference in their day. You don't you don't know what that person might add to your life. And graduate school is really one of the last best places to make your lifetime friends. So make it a priority to end this semester with at least three, four or five uh, brand new friends. So, you know, Norma, that's the advice coming from the graduate dean. As you know, I'm always going to have some for our students. Uh, but I know with this being the beginning of the semester and with our delayed start, that students are really um, have some areas where they're a bit nervous. And so, you know, my my great colleague and friend David Whitfield is here. Uh, Karina Cantu, our director of advising, may pop in in a little bit. But we really want the focus of, of this chat to be on the things that are causing you a little bit of anxiety or discomfort. So I think Norma put into the chat uh, at the beginning, um, you're, you know, take advantage of putting your questions in there because we are going to do our level best to try and answer as many of those questions as we can. So Norma, David, any comments about this month's advice? <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So I hope that students will think we about it. Especially yep. owning your mistakes. Yeah. Be humble. Own your mistakes. We all make them, including deans. We all we all make them. Okay, Norma, what's the first question? Sure. So the first question I have is um, I didn't receive, I'm a new student. I didn't receive scholarship for spring 2022. Will I be eligible to apply for summer or fall scholarship? Okay, so that is a great, great question. So if you're a brand new student that arrived here in spring of 2022, the first thing that you want to do, and this is this may be my advice for the next grad chat with the graduate dean, is be willing to read. There is a reluctance on the part of students to read things. So the first thing you want to do is to go to the graduate scholarship website and read it. And what you will learn there is that we only offer scholarships twice a year. We offer in spring and in fall for incoming students, and we only offer continuing students once a year. And so that's the answer to your question. So yes, you can apply for scholarship. The scholarship deadline is May the 1st. There are three variations of scholarships you can apply for. One of them is a Dean's Excellent Academic Merit Scholarship. So that's based on academic performance. We're not looking at GMAT, GRE scores. We're looking at um, academic performance. And remember, as a continuing student, you must be enrolled in 12 credit hours at a minimum to be eligible for any consideration. The second type of scholarship that we offer is an impact award. Those are given to students that are nominated for extraordinary service to the school through a lot of different mechanisms like student organizations or you know variables, but those are people that have been nominated that the scholarship committee considers for that kind of impact award. Then the third type of award is a donor award. That is a specific award that's been uh, amount of money that's been given by a donor where it has specific criteria. So students, you should apply for as many of these as you can, these donor awards, because you don't know how competitive those are going to be. Um, sometimes students will look at those donor awards and say, well, that's kind of a lot of extra work. You know, extra work pays. <laughs> so, you know, get out there and do that additional essay or fill out that uh, sp particular thing because that can matter. So you want to go and first read the website. Second, make sure you're enrolled in at least a minimum of 12 credit hours because if you're in less, you're not going to meet the minimum. Three, apply for every scholarship that is reasonable for you to apply for and do it by May the 1st. So I hope I've uh, answered that question. Perfect. We have a follow up uh, related to scholarship as well. Um, how would we find out or what's your advice for finding out about external scholarships that are not UTD related? Wow, that is a, um, a challenging and difficult question to answer, but I'm going to do my level best. The, uh, you should know as a student, and this is true at every university, whether you're at NYU or you're at UT Dallas, the biggest amount of scholarship money is money that comes institutionally from the institution. 
So that means that that the bulk of the biggest dollars are going to be within your institution. But there are a lot of professional associations that offer student scholarships. There are a lot of external competitions that will offer scholarship money. There are a lot of diversity organizations that have scholarship programs, especially around um, women, around underserved minorities, around um, LBG, uh, LBGTQ. Um, so, but you have to do the legwork to find those. There, there, there are a couple of centralized websites out there that are like scholarship clearinghouses. They change all the time and nobody does a really good job of keeping up with those. But if I were you and I were in a specifically a specific discipline, talk to your program director. Find out what the top professional organizations are in your area, then go and see if they are uh, offering scholarship awards. I will tell you that not a lot of people apply for those awards. They, they just don't, they don't think about going after them. So you should absolutely do that. Now also keep one other thing in mind. The university has a scholarship website as well, and they also have awards that you can apply to that they are dealing with separate from ours. So it's all about, what's the expression shoe leather? How much shoe leather you have on your soul that you're willing to go out and kind of pound the pavement and find those opportunities. So uh, get after it and start early as opposed to late. Perfect. Our next question is, how many credits can we take during our full time internship to maintain our enrollment at the university for that specific semester? And I think it might be coming from an international student. So that is um, a question that that I'm going to defer to the ISSO to answer, but this is what I can tell you. We have a lot of international students that do a full time internship. They're doing full-time internship work, working a full-time job basically, and they aren't taking any courses. So if you're in a full-time internship, it's my understanding that you don't have to be enrolled in other classes. But I will tell you that there are a ton, probably 90% of our international students who engage in an internship will also take one or two fully asynchronous classes at the same time. It helps them get ahead in their coursework. So it kind of depends upon what kind of internship you have as to whether or not you want to do that. But I have known international students who have full time jobs who are not enrolled in other classes. Also remember as an, an international student, you do not need to be enrolled in classes in the summer. Summer registration is not required. Perfect, and I went ahead and put a link to the ISSO immigration advising page that has their schedule for a live chat in case any students want to reach out to them. And they have live chat three times a week, mm -hmm. which means that you can get on and talk to somebody right then about your question. Um, this next person is pursuing a double master's degree and they're wondering, would it be OK if I graduated in more than two years, for example, three years? So um, here's that fun rule. And you know, I love, I love to be the rule champion here. It's one that I hit on uh, very frequently in orientations and I also hit on it in admission webinars. You have 72 months or six years to fulfill the degree requirements where it's a double degree, an individual degree, two MS degrees, any coursework that goes toward the awarding of a single degree must be completed in 72 months or six years. That also, so that means you could do it in three years. Absolutely, no doubt you can get it done in three years. The thing that you want to remember, and this is where students often forget, is if you transferred coursework in that counts toward that degree, your clock begins on the date of that coursework. So if you took coursework in fall of 20, and now you're in our program and you transferred in coursework from fall of 20, your clock for six years starts in fall of 20. So you just wanna be very careful. You wanna um, be sure to talk to an advisor, make sure that all your coursework is handling. Now, and you also, if you're doing a double degree, 
you also, and one of them is an MS and one of them is an MBA, you want to make sure in order to capitalize on the reduced number of hours, you want to make sure that you graduate from the MS first and the MBA follows. You do not want to graduate from the MBA first with the MS following. That doesn't work. I mean, you're not going to economize that way. So either get done with the MS first and then get the MBA or wait and get them at the same time. I love that question. This is also about a double degree master's program, but this is accounting and finance. Do they have to see an advisor for each program or how they would how would they go about getting um, information or, or advice on doing this double degree? So what I would do as a student is I would always, 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 always start with your program directors. So the, so get in the catalog and print out the degree requirements for the accounting degree, print out the degree requirements for the finance degree, go visit with both the accounting program director and the finance program director so you understand the requirements of each degree. And on the accounting side, you want to be extra careful because if you want to sit for the CPA, there are all kinds of rules about what you can double count, what you can't count, the 150 hour rule. So you want to make sure you understand that. Then send an email to JSOM GR Advising and make an appointment with an advisor who can lay out those two degrees on the same plan so that you understand, you know, if there's any opportunity to count something you take in finance toward the accounting. Accounting is a bit more restrictive. Well, actually, finance is pretty restrictive too. So you just want to be very careful to make sure that you're you're planning out what you're taking in a, in a great way. I see that Karina has joined us. Karina, do you want to uh, uh, answer that question also with regard to a double degree in accounting and finance? Yes, thank you, Dr. Powell. Yeah, so it is a very good idea to touch base with the programs first because the number one thing you want to make sure is that you are pursuing something that is going to be fruitful, right? That you have this idea of what it's going to give you. You have to make sure that it's going to give you that before you invest the time and the money that you have to invest to do those extra courses. But yeah, once you decide and talk to both programs and you decide that's exactly what's going to be what you need, send us an email, as Dr. Powell said. We will put together the degree plan, show you exactly what classes can overlap and which ones do not, so that you know exactly how many courses you need to take to take uh, get both of your degrees. Mm -hmm. I yeah, agree completely so, with you, Dr. Powell. Well, thank you. I appreciate, I really appreciate that. I do think that there is a lot of power in a double degree. But I think the power, as Karina stated really so artfully, is how you plan to leverage that double. So I'll give you another example. You know, we'll see students that'll double degree in a supply chain and in finance. And that, you know, David, you know that's a good, powerful combination because supply chain, uh, finance is kind of the core of supply chain decisions because it's all about getting your resources at the lowest value, you know what I mean, in the beginning of the chain. So talking to David about, you know, should I combine a master's of science degree with a concentration in finance with a supply chain degree? Or do I do an MS in finance with the supply chain? Because those can be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And not all combinations are advantageous. I don't know, David, I don't know if I am qualified to say this, but probably putting an accounting degree with supply chain is not nearly as fruitful as putting a finance with a supply chain or putting a marketing with a supply chain, right? Yeah. So start with your program director. They are the smartest people around. This next person, this goes back to the scholarship discussion we were having earlier. Can we take a three credit hour subject in the summer to complete the 12 hours that are required to apply for scholarship? No, uh, I hate to say it, but no, you need those 12 credit hours by the time you apply for um, the scholarship because uh, we're going to look at that, uh, those GPAs from spring. So you may want to add another course if you have the intention of applying for scholarship. <clears throat> MS marketing is now a STEM course. Do we get an updated I-20 and do we have to apply for the same? This may be an ISSO question, but I thought I'd ask it. You know, that is, uh, that's a great question and I really do not know the answer. It is my understanding 
that STEM is attached to the CIP code. So they don't, I don't know if they put a CIP code on an I-20. If there is a CIP code on an I-20, then yeah, you would probably want an updated I-20. But as Norma said earlier, go to that ISSO chat that they hold three times a week and ask them specifically that question. Uh, because that, I mean, it could make a difference. But your degree is associated with STEM. Probably not your I-20, but I could be wrong about that. So this next person was also asking about scholarship. Um, being that the deadline is May 1st, how can we apply if we have to complete 12 credit hours and our grades won't be done by May 1st? You don't have to worry about that. We will take the grades from spring because technically the committee uh, doesn't start the evaluation process until the 1st of June. So all of those spring grades are in. The next question has to do with probation. If you are in a probation program, let's say I finished my first semester in fall 2021, but unfortunately I did not get the cumulative grade GPA of 3.0. My understanding here is that we have two following semesters to improve our scores, spring 2022 and summer 2022. Is that correct? Oh, uh, Karina, you and I love this question. So I'm gonna give you some advice and we'll see if Karina agrees or disagrees with me. So if you unfortunately had a rougher fall than you expected, and let's say you got just under a 3.0 because you happen to get a C in one class or a C plus or a B minus in one class. And so you need to have, uh, you know, do better. Well, the first thing that I would tell you is, I hope that you considered very seriously whether or not you should retake a class this semester to replace a grade. Replacing a grade is the quickest way to improve your overall GPA. So if you got a C or a C plus in a class and you want to get out of probation, my advice to you would be retake that class. Now, yes, it does make your degree more expensive because you're paying for an additional three credit hours, but you are getting over the probation a lot faster. And if you take a class a second time, you've already seen the material once. You know where you went awry, so it's usually uh, easier. Now, to specifically to your question, and where I'm going to punt to Kanina in a second, is I would caution any student from having, you know, so, so you were on probation in fall of 2021. Now you're on probation in 2022. I would never recommend that you enroll in summer classes. I would almost always recommend you enroll in fall classes. And let me tell you why. Summer is a compressed semester. There's only 11 weeks in, in, the, in the summer semester. Classes are more compressed and concentrated. It is a haul. Summer classes are just tougher because they're shorter and we don't reduce the content. We increase the class hours on each of those weeks and we don't. So, so sometimes a student can make a mistake by by not understanding that they need to enroll in enough hours in summer, and then they find themselves still on probation at the end of summer, because you took one class, and you really should have taken two classes, and you should have gotten B pluses in both of them. The thing that is important is for you to know right now, what grades do I need to make this semester? Summer of, I mean, spring of 2022, what do I need to do right now what grades do I need to make right now that is going to get me off of probation this semester? So I'm going to punt to Karina and, and let her chime in as well. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bowles. So I do agree with your um, recommendations, and it is true you get your three semesters or two semesters after the one that you know you are on probation. Um, the only thing I want to add is that you also have to keep in mind core GPA because there's an overall GPA that has to be a 3.0, but it could be that the classes that you are struggling with are in the core. And if it's in the core, that also has to be at least a 3.0. So it may not be possible for you to just continue if you have nothing else to repeat. Sometimes, unfortunately, that may be the case. So just be very mindful of the classes, where they are in your degree plan, and keep in mind that it's not just overall, it is also your core GPA. And I'm glad you brought repeat up in this context, Karina, because as a graduate student, you can only repeat, have three repeats. OK, so so if you didn't do well in three core classes. You know, the quickest way to get yourself out of trouble is to repeat those core classes, but then you've used up your three repeats. So everything after that 
is going to have to be over a 3.0 in core and in overall. Well, that kind of stressed me out. <laughs> Our next question says, um, I am assigned to a different prof in the at the last minute for a subject. Um, so I think what they're saying is that at the last minute, I think the professor was changed. And so there's wondering, they're wondering if they can get in any other classes or other classes are full or if there'll be more changes. So you do have time um, to swap classes. And I think the deadline on that is the 25th. Is that correct, Karina? So you can swap classes if there's availability in those classes up until through the 25th. But, you know, it's going to depend upon whether those classes are full. And occasionally that does happen. We'll have a faculty member who becomes suddenly ill or whose wife or spouse, husband had to move to Africa and they had to go to. I mean, it, it does happen. So don't automatically assume that just because you don't have who you expect that that's a bad professor. Because, our, I mean, our professors are terrific and our feedback from our professors is terrific. Now, you can have a terrific professor who will kick your butt, who is hard, who is demanding, who is going to push you to be the best that you can. And those are great professors to have. And I encourage every student to, to embrace that. Or you can go for an easy professor. But, you know, you might come away with a A minus. But did you come away with all you need to make your career successful? So don't be afraid of a, a professor that has a tough reputation. And you know, Kanina, um, can you just remind students about the academic calendar? And I, I love my academic calendar that it's always with me. My calendar is always with me. Can you tell them where they can find it, why these dates are so important and why they should print it out and have it? Sure. Yeah, so it is very important for you to have the academic calendar. The academic calendar, if you just go to the main UT Dallas website, you're going to see a link that says resources. And there's several important things within that, but one of them is the academic calendar. And it takes you to the page that not only does it have spring 22, our current semester, but it also gives you previous semesters and it also gives you future semesters as best as planned, right? The, those future ones can still change, but you get a heads up of what, what's coming. Um, and there's a lot of important dates on that calendar, which includes when classes start, when you can register, right? You can now go into the calendar for summer and fall and figure out when you can start registering for those two semesters. So you can even start planning that now. So it just makes you aware um, the last day to register, Dr. Powell mentioned, is on the calendar. Uh, when you graduate, you have to apply for graduation. That deadline is on the calendar. Payment information is on the calendar. Refund is information is on the calendar. So there's a lot of important deadlines on that academic calendar. And so it's very important that each semester you have it handy, review it, be familiar where those dates fall um, so that you are prepared and you don't get, um, you know, caught unprepared. You know, uh, David put the link into chat to the academic calendar. So thank you, David, for doing that. The, the other thing, you know, that I, I think I would just really emphasize is if you go to the academic calendar, you're going to see like the most important dates are going to come up first in a box. And underneath that box, there is a an orange button that says view the full calendar. You want to view the full calendar and that's the one you want to print so that you have it accessible and can look at it um, all the time. You know, Norma, uh, there have been some questions that I have gotten, and David, I'm betting you have gotten them in your classes around, um, you know, attending remotely this semester. Has that happened? Oh, yeah, quite often. So uh, I want to address that because I'm getting a lot of questions about after February the 7th, I want to attend my classes remotely. I want to, I don't want to go to the campus. So, um, so I want to share with all of our international students, and you should have gotten this email from the ISSO maybe 10 days ago or so. So Norma, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. You know, I'm not very good at it. So just bear with me. I'm going to share my screen. If it will please share, please share screen. Ah! Okay, here it comes. 
And I'm gonna share, this is a letter that all of our international students should have gotten from the ISSO. And I don't know what the date of this letter is. Let's see, I'm not sure it had a date on it, but it was about 10 days ago, David, if I remember correctly. And so I wanna point this out to you guys because this has been a big uh, area of questions. If you arrived in the US, um, you know, March 20th, March 9th, 2020, since then, then these are your enrollment requirements and these are your attendance requirements. So I want you guys to look, you know, you guys pretty much know that as a graduate student and you are on an I-20, you have to be enrolled in nine credit hours. And you know that. Um, but I want you guys to look at the attendance and physical location in the US and read what that says. You must participate. I need to move my camera for a second. You must participate in the in-person components of your class when all classes revert from fully online format back to the assigned face-to-face -face or hybrid format. Specifically, you must be physically present on campus in the classroom when class is physically in session. You should retain evidence that demonstrates your engagement with the in-person course components should the ISSO or DHS ask you for that. I will tell you that every semester we get 10, 15, 20, 30 different um, requests for evidence uh, where students are having to prove that because they're moving into an OPT job or an H-1B. And then the other question is, uh, you know, a temporary class absence may happen. Of, of course, if you get COVID, that would surely could happen. You have to request accommodation from your professor who will provide you the course content. For some faculty, they may be recording the classes and keeping those links and they'll send you a recording if you miss. But the, these absences should be short term, temporary and supported with documentation for the reason for absence. So the other thing that I just want to point out to students is that, you know, you can't really um, say I, I need to attend class remotely because I'm afraid of COVID or whatever. In a case like that, you're gonna have to seek accommodation, meaning you're gonna have to go to the Office of Student Accessibility and you're gonna have to make some big case and provide a lot of documentation to do that. So the, the documentation from the international office is really clear with regard to international students about what they expect when we are back fully on campus on February the 7th. So keep that in mind. Domestic students, local students who are here, you know, you guys should be back in class as well. Now, does that mean that there isn't a faculty member out there that might be willing to let you do X, Y, and Z? That is totally a faculty member's choice. They have total discretion to make decisions that affect their classroom. But so, you know, you just need to keep that in mind. But these are the expectations. And I know that faculty have been getting a lot of questions the last 48 hours about that. And I just wanted to point out that letter. Um, so international students will go find it and then just answer that question directly. And Norma, I'm betting there might be some questions in the chat too about that. So the next question that we have is actually about internship. Um, being enrolled for 12 credit hours in spring and six credit hours in the summer semester, am I supposed to do the internship in fall as it is mandatory once I clock 18 credits? Um, considering there are not as many fall internship opportunities, what would you suggest is the best approach? Whoa, that's a great question. So first of all, you're wrong. There happen to be a lot of fall internship opportunities because there aren't as many students looking for a fall internship opportunity. The key is going to be uh, applying early, networking, doing all those things you learn in your professional development class about, you know, seeking leads, making contacts, you know, developing your small talk, your elevator pitch, and applying for lots of jobs and getting involved in student organizations, meeting alumni, attending career events, all of those things. So yes, you will need to take that internship in the fall. And you just need to start early in terms of securing it. We have tons of students. I mean, David, don't you have like dozens and dozens of students that do internship in fall? Yeah, we typically have about like 35 to 40 uh, easy in the fall. And I think and in the fall of 21, we actually, I was just pulled it up while you were talking about it. In the fall of 21, we actually had 52 internships. Yeah, and I, ITM and business analytics had literally hundreds. 
The next question is also about internship. Are there any cases that are that have enrolled in three internships for a year, one internship a semester? Oh, we have tons. We have tons of students. Actually, in, in some degree programs where the internship is required, they actually end up doing four. They do, you know, a zero credit and then a one, one, one. So that is not uncommon. And, you know, you should try and get as many internships up to three really as you can. The fourth one has to be approved. We ha it has to go through a special approval process. But, you know, that's how our students, you know, land themselves full time jobs or OPT jobs. It's like, the really long interview and what a great way to prove yourself to an employer that you are somebody that they want on their team. So absolutely, we have a ton of students. If Norma wasn't managing this webinar, she could go out to our exit survey data and tell you how many students have a second and a third internship. Those percentages are pretty high, so you should do that. And if you want to get a sense, go out and look at internship stories. Uh, if you go to our website and you go to the career to cr the career link at the website and then you go to students, you'll be able to find the link to internship stories because every time a student does an internship for credit, they are required, required to submit an internship story about their experience. And and that that website has thousands of these great internship stories. And that's a way you can identify a student who was in an internship before you and learn more about how they landed their internship. Sorry about that. My mute button was uh, acting Stop. a little crazy. Um, so the next question is actually about the Dean's Council. We have a student who saw our promotion for it and they're wondering about um, what the what the Dean's Council is looking for as far as students who apply um, and what are the interviews like? Oh, wow. We have not been asked that question before. So I feel a sneeze coming on. If I suddenly sneeze, please forgive me. But I'll try to talk without sneezing. OK, so the Dean's Council has been around since 2008 and it has a singular mission, which is to help build the reputation the pedigree and the profile of the Jindal School of Management. So everything we do is to try to promote that. So we look for students who are service minded and, and particularly students that end up on the council are those students that are just so grateful for the time that they've had here, for the, the great experiences that they've had with their faculty, for the support that we give them in registering for classes and giving them advice and for providing student organizations and they want to promote that. And so we do a lot of different kinds of projects in the Dean's Council. The big one that we do every spring is called the Owlies. It is like uh, the Jindal School's version of the Academy Awards. It's a big grand uh, ceremony and presentation where we hand out these great owl trophies. Owlie stands for outstanding worthy leaders involved exceptionally. So we try to recognize students, faculty, employers, some staff, and we give out all these great awards. In fact, one of the awards, the most coveted one, is Student Organization of the Year. I mean, the students can be like crazy for that one and wait uh, to the end for the very last award. The Dean's Council also does service projects in order to get the word out in the employer community about the great service-minded students that we have here at the Jendal School. Um, we also produce a website where we show faces of JSON, where we do profiles of great students that we have here. So we're always doing things that are going to help us get the word out. Right now, the council's working on a couple of really cool videos. Those videos that you saw in orientation, those were made by Dean's Council to help promote. So we look for students that are grateful minded, that are service oriented, that are not trying to really impress us because we're not hiring them for a job. We want people that will be themselves, who will roll up their sleeves, try things that they've never tried before, be imaginative and work hard on behalf of the school and on um, building our reputation. The interviews are fun. They're a conversation. Uh, they're not an interview like an internship or a job. And I encourage anybody who meets the criteria to apply. The deadline is, Norma, when's the deadline? Sunday? Jan or? January 21st, uh, so that's Friday. Friday. So get after it if you're going to apply. 
Um, and I do want to mention, because somebody asked in the chat, if we take uh, Dean's Council applications in the fall, and we do, we will start promoting that in early August. Um, so this next person, um, I think, might be interested in a double degree after our conversation earlier. So they are currently in an M MS program, and they're wondering how they can add another degree in finance. So the first thing they need to do is be in contact. Well, first of all, start with the program director and make sure that you want that that makes sense for your career. So I'd have a discussion about the degree program itself since you weren't admitted to that program. Um, the next thing I would do is reach out to an advisor, JSOM GR advising, and tell them you want to be considered for admission into that additional program. Because when you add a program, I mean, Karina, is it fair to say you're going back through the admissions process to be considered for admission Correct. to that program? So Correct. we have That's to awesome. sign off on it and approve it. The next question is, um, I am repeating a course because of a low GPA. In the final transcript, will my grade be replaced with the better grade or will I have both grades on my transcript? So Karina, you want to tackle that one? Sure. So your class that you took, let's say it was fall 21, it's still going to show your original grade. Once you have a new grade, so let's say you're retaking it this spring 22, that new grade is going to be what's calculated into your GPA. Then in the fall, it's still going to show the class and it'll still show the grade, but right below that it will have a comment that says repeated. So that then you'll see that it's not then counting towards your overall GPA. So it doesn't go away. The grade is still going to show, but it's going to have a document uh, documentation there that says that you repeated it and that the grade that's actually contributing to your GPA is the, the uh, uh, course that you repeated, the one that you took next. Yeah, I think that is a great question. And I, I want to address the psychology of repeated grades from an employer perspective. So first of all, there are not a lot of employers that will ever ask you for your transcript. I, consulting firms do like McKinsey, Bain, occasionally Deloitte. You don't get an often request for your transcript. And if you do, you often get it after you're hired because they have to put it in an employment file. But it is not something that they use in, in the interview process. But let's just go and say that, that they do because I think a lot of students worry, oh my gosh, that grade is always gonna show. I will tell you, having been in the corporate world in between my two academic careers, where I interviewed a lot of students and that topic came up because I worked for a financial services firm and we happened to ask for transcripts. We were kind of unusual in that sense. And when I would see a repeated grade, I would ask the student about it. And I have to tell you, when, when, they, when they answer that interview question and say, you know, earning that, that that bad grade really humbled me. And this is what I learned about what I did wrong. And this is how I changed my habits or I approached the subject matter differently. This is how I met with the professor on a weekly basis. I learned a lot about pulling myself up by my bootstraps. And quite honestly, Dr. Powell, I am probably the most proud of that retaken grade. So there are lots of ways that you can use an experience like that to demonstrate your humbleness or your work ethic or your ability to overcome a difficult situation, great answer to an interview question. And when, you, when you're when you forthright about something like that, that employer is gonna say, wow, that student didn't have to tell me that they hadn't done well the first time, but wow, were they humble and sharing what they learned by retaking that class. So don't always think that that is like this big giant stain you know, on, on your record. Everybody has a stain on their record. Just ask me about my undergraduate degree in economics, I mean, my undergraduate coursework in economics. I still don't get those, those you know, those graphs, but um, I overcame it. It didn't define the rest of my life and one bad grade or two low grades are not gonna do that. It's how you responded to that challenge and how you use that to explain why you are a stronger, better, and great em potential employee. And by the <laughs> way, if you drop a class, I guess this doesn't apply on the grad side, but students are often worried about a W. W's mean nothing. W's are not negative. If you happen you know, to ever get a W on your transcript, 
it is not going to negatively impact you. Most of the time, people don't know what a W means, and it is not negative. So get over your fears about Ws, please. I get a lot of emails about Ws. This next question has to do with just in case a student experiences some type of emergency during the semester. And the way they worded it is, how would I be able to take a medical leave or emergency leave during the peak time of the semester? Will it affect my grades? Is there any options for me to take exams again if I miss because of a medical emergency? So there would probably be two things I would do to start with. First, read the syllabus, okay? Make sure you understand if makeup exams are allowed in the course. Secondly, I do not know of any professor who has ever had a student experience a medical emergency that hasn't worked with that student on some level. So if you get real far in the semester, then, you know, and a medical emergency happens, your, your father is in, you know, the ICU in France and you got to go and be with your family or your sister's in a critical car accident and you have to go be her legs because her legs don't work for a while, whatever it is, or you have a major operation and can't be there. There is the possibility of professors giving you an incomplete and then giving you additional time to fulfill the requirements of that degree. It is essential, students, it is essential that you be in good communication with your faculty member. Don't wait until you have the emergency and disappear. If you if you have a family member, a father, a mother who's you know very ill right now, you need to let your professor know what's going on in your life because the sooner you let them know, the more that you can work for them. Where students make the mistake is they worry about it after the emergency. Don't worry about it after the emergency. Communicate ahead of it, during it, and after it because if you just disappear and you don't do anything about it those course grades where you might have gotten an incomplete will turn to f's and then you're stuck so um so be proactive goes back to the four p's that i talked about when we first started um so we have a couple more questions about internship um for this one, I'm not sure if it's an international student or a domestic student, but they say for the summer semester, if I take an internship, which is three credit hours, will I be considered as a full-time student or do I need to take another three credit hours? So in the summertime, if you are an international student, correct me if I'm wrong, Karina, you are not required to be enrolled in the summer if you are an international student. So Correct, unless it is their first semester. Unless it it's your very first semester. Yes, that's mm -hmm. a good point. So taking three is fine. Now, where I'm more concerned is why would you want to use all three credits of internship at one time? Because then you can't do a second one or a third one. So I'd ask yourself, why would you do use up three? You know, one credit of internship, if your degree requires it, one credit will get you there. You don't have to do a three, so you don't may not want to cut off your potential to get a continuing internship in the fall or the following spring. This question is also about internship. Um, Boy, what that's is the a popular subject today? It is. They're thinking about it early. Um, what is the minimum hours to fulfill the internship requirement for ITM students? Could it be virtual and could it be accomplished in any term like summer? So it, first of all, you need to look at your catalog when you came into the program. In the ITM program, it is required. If you came in fall of 21, you need to do it after you've finished 18 credit hours. So doing it at that time frame is important. So you will need to do it at that specific time. Um, you, yes, you can do it in summer. Yes, there are a lot of internships that are remote. During COVID, we had hundreds of students doing remote internships, and I think remote internships are going to be more common, even when COVID is completely in our rearview rear mirrors. Um, so yes, you can do it virtually. That needs to be very clear in your offer letter, how it's going to be done and all of that kind of stuff, but you need to do it in the sequence required by your degree. I'm not sure I answered all those questions. Did I answer I all you, of them? Yeah, I think you covered okay. it. Um, the next question is, why are some of our courses at max capacity and why cannot why can't we um, accept more students into those classes and are the wait lists over? 
So Karina, you first want to answer the waitlist question. Yes, the waitlists are over. <laughs> they officially ran for the last time last Friday. And uh, when we returned on Tuesday, they were cleared. So there's nobody else on the waitlist. So they're not running anymore. They're not active anymore. Right. And so so to answer the other question is, why can't we put more students in them? There are a lot of reasons why we can't put more students into them. Um, sometimes it's room capacity. Sometimes you just can't run a class well with uh, one over X number of students. So our, our class sizes are bigger this spring um, than they have normally been in the spring or at really any time of the year because we, we had so many more students join us, which is great, um, than maybe we expected. So that increased our class size. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't a student that's going to drop that class you really want to get into. So you need to be very mindful of getting in and seeing if there's been a drop in the class that you want to add or networking with students in that class to find somebody to let them know you're interested if they do drop. So um, so you kind of have to check the system pretty often to see, but we are at max capacity in just about every single class we have right now. David, you're teaching several classes with what, 90 students? Yeah, I have 90 students in my classes and and yeah, I had students asking me by email, can I still get in your class? I said, we're we're at capacity for the size of the classroom. Yeah, so uh, it could be that we're just full. Yeah. But now that all of you are here, we know you're here. <laughs> so it'll make adding more sections for the fall even easier. I have one more question before closing remarks. Um, how do I become a TA if my GPA won't register until the end of the semester? So we generally are hiring TAs twice a year, uh, or at least, you know, that's the way it kind of pans out. So by the time that they will begin the process, your spring grades will be in. So, you know, don't, don't worry about the lack of a GPA at the time you apply being a problem because they will look at it as, um, as you know, they close that process and start, um, start looking for TAs. I will tell you though that Faculty want to hire exceptionally successful students to be TAs. So, you know, they're going to be looking for those students who have performed uh, at the top in their classes who are going to be able to be the best teaching assistants. So you want to do really well in your classes. You and I would also say that if you want to be a TA, you know, start making sure your faculty member knows that you have an interest in that. Um, be engaged in the class discussion. Demonstrate that you're really committed to the subject matter. Pop by during office hours periodically. Ask smart and good questions. Help your classmates. Volunteer to your professor to say, hey, you know, I, I, I'm glad to be a student mentor in this class to somebody. You know, there are all kinds of things you can do to demonstrate that you would be a good person to do that, but academic performance and ex excellent ex academic performance is important. Perfect, thank you. Well, those are all the questions that we have, so I wanna give you some time for some closing remarks. Well, first of all, Norma, I wanna thank you for always running the controls behind the scene because I no way could I do that. And then I, I wanna thank my colleagues, Karina and David for being here because they always bring such value to the conversation and get me to shut up every once in a while. But, you know, it's interesting uh, at, at this junction, you know, we have spent 54 minutes mostly answering our student questions. And, and that is what really matters to us. We want to be able to answer your questions. So if you have continuing questions, and we know you're going to, your first destination to get those questions answered is your program. You've got great program support people. You've got terrific program directors. All of your degree programs have listservs where you can post questions. Start there. Most of the questions you have can be answered by your program. If you have a, a question about international immigration, OPT, always go to the best source, which is the ISSO. Their live chats are phenomenal, and you will get immediate answers in those live chats to your questions. So, you know, be proactive and go get the questions. If push comes to shove, 
you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and you've got a question that you're afraid you're going to forget, you can do one of the following three things. You can send an email to Jendal at utdallas.edu and we'll see that and you'll get an answer. Or you can send an email to JSOM question desk and you'll get an answer. Uh, you can't give on live chat at 2 a.m. because nobody's managing the live chat. You could even send an email to JSOM GR advising at utdallas.edu. But I would encourage you to start with your program. If you have got a question about the bursar or tuition, email the bursar, bursar uh, at utdallas.edu. They are fabulous about answering questions. So go to the source that can best answer the question and only email that source. Don't email 20 people because you'll get your answer uh, too late if you do that. It just becomes very problematic because then David will email me and I'll say, well, I got that same email. And then Karina will email me and say, well, what did you say? I got that email. Only send it to one person. Give us a chance. Um, and I guess in, in closing, I would say to all of our students, you know, there are huge demands on your time as a student. I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a master's student in 2022. Um, so many pressures, so many obligations. You have a burden to read so many things from your email to um, your course syllabus, to the description of your assignment, to the job description, to your degree plan, to the catalog. We realize that you're overwhelmed, but I promise you that if you put yourself in the driver's seat and you are proactive and you're productive and you are getting after it ahead of time, you are going to be a lot less stressed in what you do. Don't wait until you have an emergency. Get ahead of it, get help, get advice, and we have so many people here that will help you manage that. It's just about you getting after it in a timely way um, to take care of it. So I want you guys to be in touch with us. Please don't hesitate to ask us more questions. Thank you to the team for being here for January 2022 Chat with the Grad Dean, and we will see you guys next month. Thanks so much for joining us.